Good afternoon and welcome to the URA Holdings PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Bernard Olivier, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining me today with our investor presentation. Um, as said, we'll, we'll go through the presentation, and I think there'll be um, ample time afterwards that we can cover all the questions, and hopefully I can answer most of them for you. So to start off, then, uh, URA is listed on the standard listing of of the London Stock Exchange. We listed just over a year and a bit ago on the 2nd of March last year. And um, URA is now solely focused on the development of the Gravelot Emerald Mine back into production, um, which really came about the work that we've done last year as well, where we have established the first ever resource on, on the Gravelot Emerald Mine um, in its history. And it's a 70-year seven year mining history and uh, there's never been a formal resource estimation ever done on it. So on the back of, of what is, we'll talk a bit more on it later, but on the back of that resource estimation, um, we are now progressing into taking the Gravelot Emerald Mine, which used to be the world's biggest emerald mine at one stage in the 60s and 70s, back into production. Um, on the board and management side, I'll probably take a little bit of time and, and just cover especially my chairman, uh, Ed Nealon. Ed Nealon founded Aquarius Platinum. Uh, he developed it into the fourth biggest platinum mine in the world. He's a geologist um, and he is quite well known in the mining industry. He's done quite a few other successful um, mining companies and mining projects. And I've personally been working with Ed for the majority of my career. I've probably been working with Ed for about 20, 22 or, or so years by now. Um, I'm also a geologist, and um, as I said, with Ed Nealon, we've done quite a few things together, including Tanzanite One, which was listed in 2004 when it basically came in and brought it to London as a listing. And I've been involved with um, it as CEO since 2008. At one stage, it was the biggest uh, dividend payer on AIM, I believe. Um, and also, we were by far the biggest producer of tanzanite in the world uh, until 2014 when we sold the, the tanzanite mine, predominantly due to issues in Tanzania with illegal miners. Uh, some of my employees were unfortunately killed in the process and effectively the government took control of half of the company in Tanzania in the process. Um, but it does mean that Ed and myself has got a long history and experience in the color gemstone market. And, uh, and we are applying that, that knowledge to, to this emerald mining project, which is a unique opportunity. And it's also because of that history that the, that the project was offered to us um, very shortly after we listed uh, on, on the standard listing in London. And then Peter Redmond as well, very experienced uh, corporate finance. Peter has got many years experience in London. So together there's a team that, that's got significant knowledge of corporate markets, uh, geology and mining and color gemstones. So then a little bit more on, on the Gravelot Emerald Mine. Um, it, it really started production of 70, for 70 years in 1929, I believe. Um, in the 1960s, it became the biggest emerald mine in the world. And in about 2002, um, Gravelot, Gravelot ceased operation. It was put in care and maintenance. And, and the main reason for that was predominantly that there was uh, a change of ownership. There was quite a few sort of complicated ownership structures. And, uh, and I think because predominantly of those ownership issues in 2002, it was put on on halt. It then took quite a long time for for uh, these sort of ownership structures to be to be resolved, 
and um, and Magnum Mining subsequently in 2015 um, acquired the project after the ownership issues were resolved. And we again then got offered the opportunity to acquire it from Magnum last year. Um, the reason that the opportunity came about to buy it from Magnum, which is an ASX listed company, is they started to solely focus on their big iron project in the US, which was building a lot of momentum. And they even looked at a listing at that stage um, on the New York Stock Exchange. And a color gemstone project, especially one in South Africa, uh, would have complicated their listing process. So because of that, the project was offered to us on extremely favorable terms. Effectively, we are paying it out of future production capped at 2 million Australian dollars. Uh, and, uh, and, and when the opportunity came about, we, we immediately uh, seized it. A little bit more background then on the general, the, the gravel emerald mine is, um, I think, 113 million carats of production history over its 70 year life of mine. Um, it had at one stage over 400 people just doing sorting. And you can probably imagine the amount of issues that comes with 400 people uh, handling the emeralds and, and probably a significant amount of theft that also came about it. The, the project itself is located uh, in South Africa in um, an area that is quite close to the Kruger National Park. It's about 50 kilometers away from, from the Kruger National Park. Um, and uh, it is in a relatively well-known mining district. We are on the same power line that supplies the Palaborba copper underground copper mine. And, uh, and it's for us currently with the load shedding and electricity problems that is being experienced in South Africa, it is very fortuitous because, uh, because we are on that copper line or the, the line that feeds the copper mine and the underground mining operations do not, do not have any load shedding. Um, our electricity is actually constantly on, which is uh, currently in South Africa quite a, quite a valuable thing to have. That said, longer term, now that uh, public enterprise is allowed to contribute uh, to the electricity in South Africa, it's only happened about six months ago, there's been an absolute surge in renewable energy coming in into South Africa. Various companies are now generating power from renewable energies, and it's set to overtake the state-owned ESCOM actually quite soon. So um, at the moment, there is a bit of an energy crisis, but by all accounts, um, in about two years from now, it will be predominantly renewable energy and the energy crisis in South Africa uh, is predicted to end. Um, just carry on. The screen is a little bit small, so I can't always see where we are. So I'm just going to flip through this as we talk. As I then said, there's a tremendous history on the Gravelot Emerald Mine, which of course, when you're putting a project back into production, it's extremely valuable because there's 70 years of mining records. Um, there's a lot of information on the geology. There's a lot of already infrastructure on site. Um, yes, we have to upgrade and do a lot of work on it, but it is just so much easier when there's this wealth of information that one can start off with rather than trying to do a project sort of from a greenfields level. Um, just out of interest, as I mentioned, over 400 sorters. On the right-hand side, there is a photograph of um, the 19, I believe, 1970s when this photograph was taken with uh, sorters sitting on a belt feeder with the emeralds coming past and then sorting it by hand um, from the belt. So it uh, would have been quite a quite a sight to see at that stage, um, all that amount of people sorting emeralds. Of course, now, luckily, technology has advanced and with the use of optical or even laser sorters, uh, pretty much two people can, can do the work of those 400 people there. Um, very important thing, what have we been doing since we acquired the project is the first thing that we did is made sure the resources there. Um, we, we believed, and both Ed and myself has known of this project for quite a long time. I have visited quite a few times in the past. Uh, we also have been working with other projects with uh, a geologist called Roy Spencer, who works for um, ACA Howie. And Roy himself, as a geologist, has a long history with, with the Gravelot Emerald Mine, um, as well as another geologist 
at ACA Howie called Dave Langlet and um, oh, sort of John Langlet. And um, with the knowledge that and information we got from them, they they felt very strongly that there is a very significant resource left um, at the gravel lot mine. It was sort of thought, I suppose, in the at the end of the the project that in 2002 that there isn't a very big resource left. But uh, I certainly, and so did it, believe that the the open pits, both open pits, the, the Cobra and Discovery open pits, can be extended and that there will be additional resources. And that is exactly what we spent last year on, is to prove that, which we've done very successfully. Following drilling and resource exploration work, um, eventually in November last year, ACA, ACA how we published its independent report on our JOC compliant, and, and JOC is the sort of international standard whereby resources are published under the two main ones, or three main ones are JOC and 43101, which is the Canadian system, and then SAMREC, which is the South African system. But they're all pretty much similar. Um, we we tend to prefer to do it under the JOC code. Anyway, ACA Howie published the official JOC resource, independent resource calculated by them. And the main, the main JOC resource is 29 million carats which is extremely significant because it is basically an extension of, of the two open pits. Um, the grades are very, very similar to what, what we've previously seen in the historical mining records, which is roughly about 6 to 6.4 grams per ton. Um, and we are extremely happy with uh, being able to achieve the first ever resource, never mind jaw compliant resource, that was established on this mine. And that gave us the confidence to now proceed with, uh, I suppose, a stage or phased phase uh, restarting of mining operations at the mine. In addition to the formal JOC resource, there's also um, what is under the JOC code called exploration targets. Now, under uh, exploration targets is an interval. It's not just a set number. Exploration target is somewhere between two numbers. So there's a bottom end and a top end. And in our case, there's been 12 additional JOC exploration targets that was identified by ACA Howie that is in compliance with the JOC code. And that interval is sitting between 168 million carats and 344 million carats. Now, to put this into perspective, and remember, it's all under the jaw code, is over the life of mine of the historical mining operation, 70 years of it, there was about 113 million carats produced. And we're looking at not only 29 million carats um, officially in a resource, but potentially another 168 on the bottom side to 344, which is effectively therefore three times more than ever produced over the 70 years life of mine in a exploration target. Now, our aim is not to now go and currently convert that into a formal resource because that will acquire significant more drilling and it will be a few years. Those sort of conversion of resources can happen down the line. 29 million carats is a significant resource and probably at peak production during the last 70 years, um, it would have been 3 million or so carats per year. So we're still looking at a life of mine currently at peak production rates of historical mining of about 10 years. So I think that gives us more than enough time over the next 10 years of, of mining to be converting additional resources from exploration, uh, jork exploration target to a formal jork resource. And therefore our focus is now to move away from exploration and actually start a very sort of well manage small scale but stage-wise um, conversion from exploration into mining. And our goal is very much now to, to start up uh, production again at, at the mine. Um, as part of the, the resource work that ACA Howie did, they had to model the entire deposit and uh, they've generated uh, 3D models for us so that we can look at the ore bodies. The two main ore bodies is of course the discovery pit I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this is the discovery pit that's modeled, uh, and that is the, the Cobra pit. Uh, they basically run almost perpendicular to each other. Um, and this is where the current open pits 
that's been created over the last 70 years are located. And basically our resource is an extension of those two open bits, basically to the north, northwest and then also to the southwest. Um, there's a nice photograph, if you can see it, of the schist that is holding. It's basically a biotite schist that is hosting the, the emerald crystals. And this is a typical example of the crystals, the emerald crystals or beryl, beryl is the mineral that is sitting in that biotite schist. Again, another photograph of the biotite schist with the emerald crystal from the gravelot mine on the right-hand side and additional cross-section generated by ACA Howie uh, of the sort of central part of the uh, Cobra deposit in this case. So for the restarting of the mine, as I said earlier, we are very fortunate that there is quite significant infrastructure, but it has been standing dormant for a while and it therefore needed refurbishment, which is what we've been doing, I suppose, after the the resource estimations have been done and we we saw that it will um it will support a significant um life of mine and mining operation sorry i just saw a question coming in saying that there's significant delays uh with our feet is anybody else experiencing a delay and, and can can you hear me Hi, Bernard. We can hear you perfectly. I think the um, the delays is actually a question about something else. It's not to do with... Um, oh, sorry. I, I misunderstood. I thought it's delays on the current presentation. Um, I'll, I'll definitely look at the question then post-presentation and we can cover it then. Um, so, yes, there, there's significant infrastructure on site. You can imagine a, a, a life of mine of 70 years in the past, a big historical mining operation, but we needed to... Uh, work on upgrading infrastructure, electricity, water, and I'll talk more on this as, as we go further through the presentation. This is a satellite image. Again, you can see the two, the two open pits there and there. Um, that's a runway. That is the office and plant building. And this is some accommodation on the side. Um, and that's from a recent site visit. My chairman visited us from Australia at Neelan. It is standing in the middle there uh, with our team on the gravelot mine standing in front of the uh, dewatering screen of the, of the processing plant. And uh, we've also released, I think it was on Wednesday, an update on the work that we've been doing to basically take this project forward into mining. Now, none of this sort of items on that list probably looks extremely spectacular or anything that that looks of critical nature, but you need all of these components to come together before you can have a successful restart of mining. So um, bear with me, that might look insignificant, but having water is critically important. Having storage facilities is critical important. So one of the things we had to do is um, recreate water storage facilities. We've now got about a capacity of 20 million liters, which is a significant amount of water that we can store on site with pumping stations, piping, and so forth, all in place. Um, we've also had to upgrade our site security. We've now got it fully electrical fencing around, around the perimeter of the site, as well as around some key strategic infrastructure. Um, we've uh, worked on the, remember this is a historical mine, we've worked on the rehabilitation of some of the historical tailings and dumps that's on the mine. This is part of our uh, environmental responsibility. So we have taken over that responsibility and we've pretty much already done now over 50% of the rehabilitation that is required under the EIA and we are making significant progress. So there will no longer be a old environmental liability hanging over this project either. And we're doing all of that, you know, without breaking the budget in a very sort of responsible way, making good progress. Um, other things that we've done is just sort of upgrading of electricity. We've uh, replaced or upgraded about 80, I think, um, power poles, uh, upgraded some of the switch boxes, the, the DB boards, and just general things that is needed in order for us to be able to move into production uh, in the near future. Um, we've we've uh, refurbished and upgraded some of the management accommodation to the point where 
management and, and um, everybody that's currently involved with the project can stay on site. Um, Ed Nealon and myself, when we visited with an international gemologist who is more on this buying and selling side, uh, we stayed on site. So site is now you know, really coming along into the point where it is getting closer and closer to being able to actually become a producing mine again. Um, we've also upgraded the dewatering and screening circuit, and there's more work to do on the actual um, processing plant with the, the crusher and milling circuit, and that is sort of our, our next stage now, is that we're starting to upgrade the crushing and milling circuits as well. So we're making good progress then, obviously, in on the mining side and mining preparation side and infrastructure side. But where are we globally, I suppose, in a colored gemstone? It's not something that's um, that well known. There isn't a lot of colored gemstone companies that's listed out there. And I suppose that that sort of raises questions as to um, what is the colored gemstone market doing? How are price trends? Uh, and especially then with emeralds, where is it going? Is it currently going up or down? And I think a very good reference that anybody who wants to do more research can go look at is, is Gemfields. Gemfields is also listed in London on AIM. Um, and Gemfields, I think they listed about three years ago. Gemfields own the K-Gem Emerald Mine in Zimbabwe, uh, in Zambia, sorry. And um, also a ruby mining operation in Mozambique. And the KGM mine is now the biggest producer of emeralds in the world. And gem fields, through their auction system, do publish their, their um, marketing information, their auction information. So it gives you a sort of good reference as to what is happening in the emerald market and price trends. And if we then look at it, um, very interestingly enough, despite us going through the whole period of COVID and, and all of the issues that went with it, colored gemstones actually didn't fare too badly compared to a lot of other commodities during that period. As you can see there, if I can zoom in a bit, um, sorry, that's too small for me to see. Bernard, what you can do is if you hover your mouse over the slide deck, you can yes. put it in full screen. So if you hover your mouse over the slide deck in the top right hand corner, you should be able to see full. Um, look, I think it's fine like that. I can I can sort of see at the back end here. If can people see my cursor? Can they no, see them pointing? No, they can't. But the the, the well, slides are, are larger for the attendees. The second slide. Um, if you look at sort of over twenty twenty, you can see the dip that was caused by by COVID and the lockdown. But compared to a lot of other commodities, it's actually quite insignificant. And the recovery since then has been ongoing. In twenty twenty one. Uh, Gem Fields reported a significant price correction again post-COVID and actually started to achieve record pricing through 2021. That trend continued through 2022 when Gem Fields had uh, five emerald auctions and they had revenues of over £125 million pounds during 2020, 2022. Um, and they kept on seeing, seeing emerald prices increasing. Uh, so much so that Gemfields have just finished up another auction in beginning of June this year. And again, it was a record-breaking emerald auction. They, they had a total sales of $43.7 million. And the overall price that they had for the price per carat is $165 per carat. Now, this is the top-end stones that they were selling. But that is, again, that's an all-time record um, for, for emeralds. So there is clearly a continuation of um, increases of prices. A lot of this would be driven by, by gem fields and their marketing, but also consistent supply and very importantly, having this source of um, basically provenance where they can show that this has been responsibly mined uh, and proof of provenance is becoming more and more important. And of course, on the gravel side, we've got exactly the same is we are able to comply with all international regulations. There's clear proof of provenance. And that's extremely important now in the color gemstone industry, as it is with the diamond industry. So just to recap, uh, if we look at these graphs, this is from pretty much the only independent body that, 
that does um, valuations and price modeling, which is called Gemvol. So here we can see Gemvol showing us from 2020 through to 2021 and an uptrending curve on the prices for, for emeralds. And at the bottom slide, it's uh, pretty much a 10 year a 10 year graph and you can see from about 2014 there was a significant price increase in emeralds which then was maintained through a little dip in 2020 and now it's um, unfortunately the graph stops at 2021 but as you can see already from the published data by Jim Fields it just continues to to meet um, a price increase and record prices um, the next slide, this is again a bit more information from Gemvol. Uh, they break down market value of emeralds. And this is a colored chart of emeralds on the left-hand side. And what is interesting is that the most sort of highest value color for emeralds is what is called a bluish green. And that's the top, the top uh, square there. And bluish green fetches uh, the best price and the highest price. And bluish green is exactly what the emerald mine at Gravelot is known for. It is considered to be some of the best colored emeralds in the world. Uh, and that is what was driving almost that 70 years or more of, of production is the color of the stones. Um, so we are very fortunate that we're sitting in that biggest biggest bracket of, or the highest bracket of color. Um, gem fields on the other hand, the, the color is a bit more yellowish green, but their sizes are again, uh, what what benefits them they get some really large crystals so maybe not always the best color but some larger crystals and then if we look at the right hand side this this for me is quite an interesting comparison um, it's again gem vol doing a colored gemstone versus diamond graph and what they're showing here is the trend for color gemstones from 2005 through to i think 2021 or 20 um, and it shows in red the diamond graph. And at about 2013, color gems then started to overtake um, in terms of, of growth uh, and, and price increases the, the, the diamond line. And diamonds actually leveled off and, and actually decreased a little bit since 2014, 2015. Uh, whereas color gemstones continue to increase in price. And by where we are now, there's actually a, quite a significant difference between uh, this index with color gemstones continuing to increase in price, whereas diamonds are actually softening slightly in price. Um, I think just to, to recap a bit as we're coming sort of to the last few slides is... Um, what makes this quite an exceptional opportunity for a company like like ura is, is the fact that there is this large historical database 70 years life of mine existing infrastructure a granted mining license that has got still another 20 odd years and can be renewed in addition to that uh, and the opportunity to give us near-term near-term production uh, at very very low cost uh, secondly, um, the resource that we were able to establish last year, it's a very significant resource, 29 million, million carats where we are sitting now with an additional 168 to 240 or 344, that's a that's an error in there, uh, million carats in an exploration target means that we can quite comfortably uh, commit to putting this back into production and not worry that we're going to run out of, out of ore and out of emeralds to mine. Um, in addition to that, there's the the prices that's been achieved recently by gem fields and a clear market trend that colored gemstones are becoming more and more popular. And if we just look at roughly the lowest product that gem fields is selling, and we take that and that's roughly nine dollars per carat, and that is what they called commercial grade, which is a nice name for their lowest grade. And we just assign that to our 29 million carats. It actually gives us a value in the ground of 261 million million dollars in the ground that we currently have in that resource. Now, I'm not saying we're only going to get material that is the lower end of the gem field spectrum. I'm just showing you a very conservative uh, estimation. Should we use their lower, absolute lowest product that they are that they are selling 
um, to put things in a little bit of perspective, perspective as to uh, you know what we what we potentially have here. Um, also, then the next item is that the Gravelot Emerald Mine has got brand recognition. It's also known in some places, uh, such as India, as the Cobra Emerald Mine, and uh, it is also known, as I said earlier, for its quite exceptional colours. So. Um, you know, it already helps when you've got a brand that is, it's now been a few years, but there's a lot of people that remember the Cobra Emeralds or the Gravelot Emeralds uh, and its exceptional colors. Uh, and then finally, I think is uh, also the fact that the board, the board has got experience in color gemstone. Um, and the advantage of color gemstones is that a small company like us can actually take a project into production. The, the CapEx requirements for taking a colored gemstone mine into production is a fraction of the cost of, for example, starting up a, a gold mine or a copper mine or, you know, almost any other commodity. Um, and, you know, we have estimated that the CapEx requirement that we need to restart is about a million pounds. Um, and, you know, that's about a quarter of our market cap. I, you know, I think there's very few companies that's trying to restart a mining operation where the capex requirement is is just a quarter of their market cap to restart mining and and um, and start revenue producing and uh, with a very good modeling uh, estimation of profitability. So um, really, it is something that is well achievable. Uh, the numbers are not outrageous uh, in order to get us back into production. And, um, you know, we've got a clear path on how to achieve it over the next six to 12 months. Um, just to recap a little bit, because we we did originally list on these strategic minerals in, in Zambia. Now, those projects are not uh, at all being discarded. It's just we've put it on the back burner. The licenses are in good standing. Uh, we do have these projects still in Zambia. It's a combination of niobium, tantalum, beryllium, uh, rare earth elements, uh, and graphite. But it is extremely green fields. And, you know, we can probably drill out that million pounds that would get us into production on Gravelot. We can drill out a million pounds worth of drilling on these projects and maybe not even have a jaw resource, never mind a sizable jaw resource. So in terms of, of deciding where to best invest money, which, you know, in current market conditions are tight, everybody's feeling the inflation, is we believe um, money spent in getting the mine back into production and actually revenue producing and, and profitability is where we should be focusing on rather than the greenfields exploration projects in Zambia. As much as we all you know, like uh, critical metals and strategic minerals, it will require a lot of, a lot of money to take it forward. So our strategy is effectively get the Gravelot mine into production, start producing revenue. And if once we've got more profit and we know what to do, we can always then start to see, you know, if we want to continue with the drilling and work on, on these projects in Zambia. Um, to, to then just as a, as a sort of second last slide, capital structure, um, uh, share price currently is about 2.45 P or two and a, two and a half P. Uh, we listed at 2p, so it's had a slight increase. But I think only now that we've got uh, a clear strategy, we've done the work on the resource, we are starting to ramp up on on advertising just what we have. We needed to make sure that we are comfortable with, with the path forward. And I think you'll see a, a lot of more news flow coming out as we progress this back into production, uh, as well as you know our PR campaign so that this market awareness is also now starting starting to ramp up. Um, market cap at the moment is about 3.8 million pounds and uh, it, it's a, a pretty tightly held share structure as well. Um, I'm coming to the, the end of, of the presentation. So I think just to, to recap, I think we've got a tremendous opportunity to put a, a famous mine back into production. It's a near term production goal, six to 12 months. Uh, successful team behind it, um, you know, as I said, with especially somebody like Ed Nealon, who's built the world's fourth biggest platinum mine. Um, there is clearly experience there and ability to to start up mining operations. 
and um, a clear route for us as a team, including our shareholders, to take this forward and unlock value. Um, Gemfields, just as a reference again, is actually highly profitable, which shows that Color Gemstones is, um, is certainly able to be a very profitable operation. Gemfields market cap, I believe, is around 200 and 200 million or so pounds. Um, they had revenue last year of $340 million. And I think their profit margin or their profit was about $100 million in profit. So uh, it it sort of reaffirms that color gemstones can be very profitable. Um, and it is a bit of a niche market, but I think we've got a very unique opportunity. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the end of the formal presentation. I think now we sort of switch over to uh, questions and answers yeah. and, uh, and the general discussion. Bernard, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to read those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Bernard, we have received questions through today's presentation, and if I could just ask you to just read out those questions and give responses where it is appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I've, I see there's about three questions on um, on funding and and what funds are available. When are we having to raise funds? So, I think the first thing is is that you know the the capex requirement is the lowest you can probably want for restarting of a mining operation, but it is still a significant amount in the current markets, and therefore we are taking it very responsibly. We've in May we've done a capital raise that was oversubscribed. We did it pretty much at no discount at the market price. We raised um, 330,000 pounds, which was our available headroom at the time. Um, it was strongly supported by our, our shareholders and board, uh, as well as um, other other people who came in into that placement for the first time. So, you know, I, I think the path forward is is clearly we are going to have to raise more money as we go ahead, but we're doing it in smaller sort of increments. Um, and we then deliver and they will be, you know, a clearly seen sort of path towards production with what we are achieving along the way. Um, as for Wednesday's announcement, which, you know, I, I think although it looks pretty boring, perhaps it's very important that all these things fall in place before a mine can go in production. And, and there'll be, you know, more of these sort of milestones that we achieved leading up into production. And we will raise the money as and when required um, over the next six to 12 months to get us into production um, with, you know, the support of, of, of our shareholders and the market. So I think we, we will have to be very sensible and, and understand that, you know, nobody wants dilution. And, uh, but we do need to to move forward as well. Luckily, the whole process is quite flexible, and we can we can raise the money when when it is uh, the right time and not before it is needed, for example. And at the moment, we've got enough funds to continue with our current our current work uh, for the foreseeable future. So I hope that sort of answers it. But yes, we will just do it through effectively equity placements, uh, debt financing uh, is probably going to cost us more just to generate. Um, the required documentation and feasibility studies that then we need to raise in the first place. So, and, and even then you're sitting with high interest rates and, and a, a debt load in your, in your books. And so uh, raising the required money in the capital markets is, is the way forward. And as I said, we we do have strong support from our, our shareholders. Um, if I go then to the next question, it's asking, and this is sorry where I got, I sort of saw it out of the corner of my eye. I got confused. I thought they were saying they experiencing delays with my presentation, but now the question is, am I experiencing delays with equipment? Uh, and do we have um, backups in case there are failure or are these sort of typical lead times for items? Um, South Africa is well known for its, I suppose, mining history, and there is actually a lot of equipment available secondhand. So most of what we are doing on the mine is 
not new machinery that we are that we are uh, using. We re-equipping and using second-hand machinery mostly. We're trying to get this mine back in production at the lowest possible cost. Once we are in production and we've got sort of revenue coming in, then we can upgrade and expand the the operations. But what we are doing at the moment is absolute cost saving. We're buying second-hand equipment locally sourced. Um, there's only one or two items, and especially the optical sorter, which is a bit of a niche item. It's a custom design optical sorter that has to be that through some test work that we've done was was designed. And this is one of the few items that we have to bring in from overseas. Um, so other than that, the rest of the the crushing, the milling conveyors, all of those things are sourced locally and almost all of it is, is second hand equipment. Good quality and we've got a phenomenal team who are able to to maintain and um, and even upgrade these second hand machines for us. But yes, we are doing it at the lowest possible cost. Um, next question is what sort of milestones do we do we expect to see um, as we sort of restart mining operation? Uh, and I suppose you know it's it's quite similar to what we've announced on Wednesday. It's it's just talking people through what we are doing on site. Uh, for example, if we if we order and uh, if we purchase a major piece of machinery, we will update the market. Um, there's also other work that we're happening in the background with. Um, on the sales side, we've got quite a few interested parties who want to come in and and sign potential agreements with us. So I suppose over the next six to twelve months, there will be uh, quite a quite a bit of news flow as you know we progress forward into production. Uh, and anything that we are doing in terms of equipment that is being installed or supplied, I think we will we will update the market and, and take you through it all as we as we progress. Um, the next question is, how would the emeralds be sold to the market? So um, the current gemstone market, as shown, and especially emeralds, as shown by gem fields, has gone through a bit of a transformation. And a lot of sales are now done through the auction system. When I was running Tanzanite 1, we mostly use a site system rather than an auction system. We did do some some auctions but it was predominantly a site system but the auction system now seems to work very well for gem fields um, and it's becoming more and more used uh, in in the industry to have uh, auctions if it's correctly graded and sorted some of these auctions are even blind auctions people know exactly that they are going to buy uh, this sort of group of of uh, a bit like the diamond industry this classification of stones uh, in this quantity and and therefore in these auctions some of it is is currently happening for gem fields even as blind auctions so we will we will not try and rent a, reinvent the wheel uh, and and follow a similar sort of path that gem fields is taking with um, with auctions bringing in um, the the big industry players uh, and a lot of overlap actually from from my days at Tanzanite one it's some of the same companies are, are also in other color gemstones such as emeralds. So we we will just follow a sort of known path to sell it into the market. Bernard, thanks for that. I think you've actually managed to address all those questions um, from investors. And of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself, Bernard, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Um, yes. Well. Again, I would just like to thank everybody who took the time to to listen to this. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was able to explain a little bit of, of what is happening in the color gems and industry, but also with, with this project, which I think is a phenomenal opportunity to be able to put this grab a lot mine back into production. It's got such a long history. It's got a clear track record of being uh, a very economically viable project. And over the years as well, uh, emerald prices have just been increasing. So. Um, you know, I see, I, I see a very exciting future ahead for the company, and I hope that um, that investors will join us for it going forward.
and our thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of URA Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.